start our recording now. Um, and I want to say a huge welcome to everybody and thank you for joining us this evening to celebrate How Sound at CatSim's incredible ocean communities and to kickstart World Oceans Week. World Oceans Day is officially tomorrow, but we're, we're celebrating early. Um, my name is Fiona Beatty, and I'm here with my co-host Bridget John. We're super excited to take you on a journey tonight to learn about the life that thrives in and around How Sound at Catsum. Tonight, we will hear stories from some of the superstars of the Sounds Marine Food Web. Plankton, eelgrass, and herring. Um, we'll also learn about how community voices and local and indigenous knowledge are being brought together to inform decision-making and education in the region. And we'll watch a short video that showcases some of the amazing work done by the Marine Reference Guides team over the past few years to create maps, tools, knowledge, and relationships that strengthen our region's ability to protect ocean and community health. So tonight is all about how sound at Katsum, which is the red blob in the middle of this map. At Katsum is one of three Squamish nation place names for the ocean here and references the journey by canoe from Squamish out toward the mouth of the sound and the Strait of Georgia. And I show this map as a reminder that what we are going to be talking about is very place-based and really focused on the deep water glacial fjord that is at Katsum but the stories and lessons and knowledge are also intricately connected with the water, people, and communities throughout the Strait of Georgia and the Salish Sea. The waters that flow into and out of Atkatsum are a core part of the Squamish Nation's ancestral and unceded territory, which is where we are joining from tonight. We're so grateful to be working with and learning from the Squamish Nation throughout our project, and we're really excited that we'll get to hear from the nation's counselors and youth throughout the rest of the evening. Before proceeding with our program, I do want to bring forward that while our event tonight is about celebration and community building and ocean health, there is a lot of work that still needs to be done to heal from the trauma that has occurred to Indigenous communities over the past centuries since settlers have made contact in Canada. And the recent discovery of the 215 unmarked graves at the Kamloops Residential School is a poignant reminder of this. So we hope that everybody listening today has been able to take space over the past few weeks to remember and mourn this history and to heal with your community. Um, and for the non-Indigenous folks on this call, we're dropping a link into the chat to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. We encourage you to take the time to read this report carefully and identify ways that you can actively advance reconciliation so that all communities throughout our region, this territory and the country can feel safe, practice culture, can heal, and can enjoy a healthy ocean for generations to come. So at this point, if um, you haven't yet, please do put a territorial acknowledgement into the chat to acknowledge where you're joining from and the nations on whose lands or waters you're currently residing. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Bridget to walk us through some housekeeping things. Um, so we have a few things to go through before beginning the event. As this is a Zoom webinar, you as an attendee won't have access to your audio or video. However, we do highly encourage you to use the chat box for any comments you may have. Um, one tip for the chat is that when you're sending a message, make sure to you select the option to send the message to all attendees so that everyone can read your message, not just Fiona and I as the panelists. Uh, the best viewing option is to click the view button in the top right and select speaker view. We have a few fun multiple choice questions for you that will pop up on the screen, so stay tuned. The event will be recorded and posted on our website after, so if you miss anything, don't worry. So between now and eight o'clock, join us and celebrate How Sound Akatsum's Ocean and Community. From our interactive map, community network map, eelgrass, herring, plankton, interviews, and so much more. Um, and even a brand new Marine Reference Guide promo video, we have a lot to share tonight. Now, I would like to pass it off to Chris Lewis to provide a welcome from the Squamish Nation. Mm -hmm. Chris Lewis is a council member and a spokesperson for the Squamish Nation, and we're so grateful for the leadership and support that Chris has provided for the project over the last few years. I'm just wondering if I can get my video up. Yeah, for sure. It basically st states that the host has stopped 
my video. Um, I'm going to make you propose just so that you can share your video. Can you try again? That okay, is. there we go. All <laughs> right. Hatsukwal Tanoya. Chinquemantomi Kakakanak Kesiam. Just opening in the Skohotmish language. Uh, saying it's great to see each and every one of you virtually here. Um, thank you all for letting us know who you are and where you're coming from on this beautiful evening. Want to thank Fiona and Bridget for the excellent invitation. Want to thank the creator for the beautiful day. As was mentioned, uh, my ancestral name is C. Tocton. Uh, given name is Chris Lewis. I am one of 16 elected council members of the Squamish Nation and also one of the political spokespersons along with my colleague, Col Selim. And on behalf of our council, I uh, have the pleasure to welcome you all to this virtual space and can't wait until we can all meet in person and uh, have conversations kind of at the, the coffee table and the water coolers and missing all of all of those things. and. Again, want to thank you all on behalf of the Skohotmish people. And I was thinking while I was having dinner with my children, what Akatsa means to the Skohotmish people and what this 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 deep water fjord is we say in, in a in an English sense means to the Skohotmish people. There's many terms around Skohotmish. Uh, we are the Skohotmish. Uh, some of our elders reference the, the north wind, the wind that comes, blows out in the morning and then blows back in the windy place of Skohot. Um, there's many translations in that we are the people of that north wind, of that wind that you experience when you're on the sound. That's how our relatives to the south, north and east recognize us. And we call, as was Fiona mentioned, we have many place names for this beautiful sound. Um, at Katsum is one that has risen to the top. Um, and it really means in, in a marine reference, because we're at the marine reference guide, as many of our place names you see on the maps uh, are place names from a marine reference sense. What did you see when you were in the canoe? What did the mountain look like? What did the point look like? What did the rocks look like? It was really a reference from when we were paddling these great waters. Um, so at Katsum means to go into, to sail in or sail out of a bay and move forward in all of this aspect. And I think about this marine reference guide and kind of what from a marine sense, the sound means to us. I think of it as a place where two-headed sea serpents, a mythological creature, many of them um, occupied and tell us of great stories. I think about supernatural waters and creatures that our elders would tell us about. I think of resting places and training places where our people would include themselves to kind of seek power and seek guidance in terms of who they wanted to be and what they were going to become and what role they were going to occupy in their in their human life. And I think about shelters, camping spots, places of resources, transformer rocks of animals and people that remind us of a mythological time where we are constantly reminded as Skohotmish people of the power and the connection that we have with all of creation. I think of places of peacemaking where we, we, we had peace with our warring relatives to the north, to the south, to the east, where we hosted great potlatches, where mink as, as, a, as one of our relatives, and we all think of mink as a little well, like marmot, little animal, but Mink hosted this great potlatch on Chukwinelch, which is known as Gambier Island, where a whale got stuck in the door and everybody got stuck in there. I think about all of those stories that our ancestors have told us that, that they transcend the notion of time. And I think of defensive fortitudes and first ancestor places where our people fell from the sky and landed on the great longhouse. And I think of places where we've met 
the first non-Indigenous peoples, the sailors that came from a faraway land. All of those things are an at katsum when I think about this beautiful place and this beautiful sound, that's what it says to the Skohopmish people. That's what, that's how rich it is to us as a people. And our history is all of your history. We think about that richness and we pull it in because when we think of times that we have gone through and the trials and tribulations of residential schools and the hurt and pain that we continue to endure as an indigenous people and as a country now, I think of the richness that the sound is reverberating. That's in the rock, it's in the stone, it's in the water, it's in the creeks that flow down. It's all around us. We just, as my great auntie would say, I said, what happened to all of these creatures? Where did they all go? What, what happened to all the supernatural creatures? She said, nephew, we just lost the ability to see them. We must train ourselves to see those things again and reconnect to those things again. So on behalf of our Skohopmish people, I welcome you and thank you for this great honor. And I look forward to all of the great work that we continue to do. I cherish and uphold the memorandum of understanding that we have with the Marine Reference Guide that we're going to uphold our young youth that are coming up and, and hold up our people for really the notion of protection and restoration and stewardship of this great waters that we call at Katsum and everything that is in it. Osiam Tamat Quitsi Snechum, those are my words and thank you for being here tonight. We are all honored by your presence. Osiam. Thank you so much, Chris. That was a really wonderful welcome. And um, I really appreciate the words that you shared in reference to um, the value and the meaning of this project. Um, uh, and we're kind of on the same page because I, the, the next short portion, I kind of want to walk us through a little bit of a visualization exercise. You, you sort of already set, set the stage for it. Um, and so I invite everybody who's joined in this call, all 126 of you, um, to visualize being on a ferry or a water taxi or a boat from Horseshoe Bay or, or to Bowen or Gambier or Langdale. Um, or maybe you're on a car, in a car and driving up the Sea Sky Highway to Squamish, Whistler, or beyond. You look out into How Sound at Katsum, and what do you see? What does your mind focus on? The sparkling blue water, the gray misty skies, the layers of mountains and islands. Do you know the names of the islands? Do you know their place names, their stories or histories? Or maybe you're thinking about the whales that you saw recently or the sounds of seabirds along the shoreline, the smell of salty air in harbors and marinas, or the feel of eelgrass as you swim in shallow water. Maybe you're remembering going to the beach as a kid and scrambling around the sound's rocky shoreline, searching for crabs in the intertidal zone. Maybe you're thinking about the countless hours you've spent fishing on the sound, or working at the log sorts, or diving and exploring the underwater world. Or maybe you're simply sitting at the beach and staring out at the water, and the waves lost in thought. There are countless ways that we connect with the ocean here. And our project, the Marine Reference Guide, our goal is to protect those diverse ways of connecting with and valuing the region's water by creating maps and resources that inform planning, decision-making, and education. So since 2018, when the Marine Reference Guide started, um, it started when local governments in the area realized that they needed a tool that would help them bridge the gaps between their jurisdictions, a tool that would centralize and provide access to data about the region's ocean, and that would strengthen their ability to manage and mitigate the many pressures that impact ocean sectors. Some of these pressures include climate change, shipping and resource extraction, recreation and tourism, and coastal development. So we set out to create an online interactive map, which we're super excited to be launching today that visualizes hundreds of data layers and reports about the sounds, ocean, and fresh water. You can use this map to identify areas that are important for different reasons, ecological, economic, social, cultural, and to understand how those reasons or those values interact with space. Maybe there's areas where there's deep compatibility across values and other places where there might be conflict. But either way, this map really helps to lift the ocean's veil so that more people can better understand what's happening and more people have access 
to robust and holistic information about Atkaston's water. So this map is live on our website and ready to be explored and used by all of you. So we're, going to, we're not gonna go into any of the technicalities of it tonight, um, but if you're super keen to learn about it, then we invite you to participate in a technical webinar that we're gonna hold at the end of June to really dive into the details about the map, um, which we've just provided a link to the chat or a link to register in the chat. Um, but something that's really interesting about the Marine Reference Guide is as we worked to create this map and this decision support tool, our project evolved to become much more than just a map. Um, we began to do field work and research to fill knowledge gaps about the ocean and the people here. And we started to invest a lot of energy into community engagement and relationship building. So tonight, we're going to focus on those activities and share some of the Marine Reference Guide's highlights over the past few years. So we'll start with a presentation about research that we're doing on some very tiny plants and animals that form the base of the marine food web throughout the world. What is that fact? Or more than 50% of the oxygen we breathe is produced by phytoplankton. Trees create a lot of oxygen, but phytoplankton create more. Plankton are basically anything that's carried by the tides, the currents. It's a super broad category. It's almost like saying anything with four legs. There are two main types, zooplankton, the animals, and phytoplankton, the plants. I.e. plankton from SpongeBob is a type of zooplankton called a copepod. It's got a way to move itself around with its arms and its legs. Whereas phytoplankton only move with the water. Plankton, they store carbon dioxide. They feed humpback whales, herring, and other forage fish. Crabs, barnacles have a planktonic stage. Jellyfish and herring eggs, or chemish, are also considered plankton. That's why it's so important. Plankton are healthy in our global oceans, rivers, and lakes, but also in how sound a cat's own, right here. So from the beginning, the Marine Reference Guide has wanted to fill knowledge gaps. The 2017 Ocean Watch report highlighted some knowledge gaps on plankton. It indicated that there was limited plankton data in House Santa Catsum due to a wide-scale study not being done since the 1970s. And a lot has changed since then, with less industry and more remediation efforts. So in 2019, we started planning for a year-long plankton survey in the Sound for 2020, which then turned into 2021 due to the ongoing, ongoing, global, ongoing global pandemic. Um, we have so far completed three surveys this year with two more to go. Our survey locations on the right with yellow dots are pretty much the same as what Stockner et al. did in the 1970s, which is on the left. This is super cool because then we can compare how plankton abundance and biodiversity has changed over 50 years. It can answer questions like what species have been lost or gained due to climate change. To do this work, it's been fantastic partnering with the Pacific Salmon Foundation, Ocean Networks Canada, and Freedom Diving Systems. Here we are pulling in the CTD in January which measures temperature, salinity, chlorophyll, oxygen, and depth. So that when we collect plankton samples, that information can give us a little bit more insight into what we're seeing. So looking at variables like temperature, salinity, chlorophyll, oxygen, we can figure out why there's more plankton or different types of plankton in certain areas. Depending on where we're sampling in the sound, the zooplankton abundance and biodiversity can be a little bit different by location. So our first poll question for you, one of the samples is from the Squamish estuary and the other sample is from the Street of Georgia. And the question is, the question, question is, the left sample is from blank and the right sample is from blank. Oh, I see Jess is coming in. We'll keep this poll open for about 30 seconds if you want to try to guess where the sample is from. Okay. 
<laughs> it's tricky, it's tricky. Think about what's in the water. Yeah, five seconds left. What's the tides and the currents doing? Is there a river that affects what might be happening? All right, I'm gonna go end the poll now. And there's a the result. Can you all see that? I hope. All right, cool. So yeah, uh, not quite. <laughs> it's a tricky one. So the left is actually from the Squamish estuary and the right is from the Strait of Georgia. With all the glacial silt coming out of the Squamish River, it produces the light that can get into the water and therefore there's less plankton where it's silty because the phytoplankton depends on the light. Super cool though. Thank you, Jessie. Yeah, really, really close. Nice work, people. So with this wide scale plankton project for the sound being done, the Ocean Watch rating has increased from 2017 to 2020. Um, so stay tuned for the plankton report at the end of this year after our sampling is complete. But for now, please feel free to check out the plankton blog in the chat to learn more. And Fiona's just putting that one in there. So there is another important marine plant in a capsum that produces oxygen and plays a really vital role in the ocean, which Fiona will speak to next. All right, so a couple of years ago, I had no idea what this plant was going to do. My only association really with it was that when I was swimming around Bowen Island in the fall or summer at low tide, I would, it would snake around my ankles and give me the heebie -jeebies. Um, over the past few years, however, my relationship with this plant has drastically changed. Oh, and I just got a note that people can't really hear me. Um, I'm not sure what to do about that. It's a bit better now. Okay, I'll just speak closer to the camera and the computer. Okay, good stuff. So I was essentially just saying that I used to not know what eelgrass was, and it, it was just kind of this weird association when I swam around. Um, but over the past few years, my relationship has changed as, I, as I've gotten to know it. I'll center myself. <laughs> and now whenever I see it, I get really excited and very protective over it. Um, so this plant is called eelgrass. And it's super important for a whole host of ecological reasons. First, it provides habitat and refuge to hundreds of species of marine life in the Salish Sea. And some of the most common residents of eelgrass meadows include dungeness crabs, juvenile rockfish and salmon, little snails and invertebrates. Um, but this plant, in addition to providing habitat, also provides services to humans. So healthy eelgrass beds are some of the most effective plants at storing carbon, which makes them really important in a climate change context. And in fact, they rival terrestrial forests at doing this. So this is a really important thing to keep in mind as we're thinking of nature-based solutions to climate change. Um, and now I'm gonna pop up a poll to ask what your main association with eelgrass is. Two seconds. Okay, so we'll keep this poll up for around 30 seconds as well. And I'm looking forward to hearing and seeing all of the votes coming in so quickly. Um, so essentially on a scale of one to five, what do you think of eelgrass? One is you, it's gross. Two is it's like slightly annoying. It grows where I don't want it to grow. Um, three is neutral. I don't really have any feelings about it. Four is it's amazing. And five is I absolutely love it. I would wear it in my hair. <laughs> All right, so we'll close the poll in a couple seconds and share the results with you. And we have a pretty friendly crowd. Everybody seems to generally like eelgrass, which I am appreciative of. Okay, so in 2017, kind of similar to what Bridget showed, this is the um, ranking from the Ocean Watch report, which identified that eelgrass in the sound was in a critical condition. And this is the lowest possible rank that anything could have um, been assigned in that report. The reason being is that we didn't have data for where eelgrass, whether eelgrass existed in a large part of the sound, and it was also being degraded quite intensely throughout the sound and the Salish Sea due to a combination of climate change and coastal development. So we decided to address this critical condition um, by gathering baseline data about the distribution of eelgrass along the Sound's mainland shoreline. So in 2019, 
The Marine Reference Guide partnered with OceanWise's research team and the Sea Change Marine Conservation Society to conduct a survey along the sound's mainland shoreline of eelgrass. We used an underwater camera, which is shown on the left of the slide, to track and record where eelgrass is growing. And it was super neat for me to see firsthand how so much of the seafloor in the sound is quite one dimensional. It's like a rocky or a sandy bottom. And then where eelgrass grows, there's this incredibly complex 3D habitat for fish, and for crabs to take refuge in. So it's kind of like comparing pavement to a forest. Where would you rather hang out? Um, so you can read through our survey methods and findings in our eelgrass report, which is available on our website, in which we're popping or we're just popping links in the chat now. Now, if you're curious about whether there's eelgrass close to a bay that you visit frequently in the sound, um, you can check it out in our online maps. So this is um, showing us in pink now where eelgrass has been mapped and located in the sound. Um, and now I'm going to turn on the 2019 survey data, which is in yellow. And we essentially, we boated along the whole mainland shoreline and we didn't really find that much eelgrass along the northern edge, not surprising because it's mostly rocky cliffs, but we did find a ton of it growing along West House Sound. Um, so that was pretty cool to sort of contribute this new information to our regional database. And this work, along with a bunch of restoration work that has been led by sea change in the region, has meant that the status of eelgrass in the sound um, improved from critical to caution in the 2020 House Sound Ocean Watch edition. So that's a really great improvement over just three years and we're pretty pumped about it. Another exciting thing about this research to me is that the data is already informing regional decision making. Um, the town of Gibsons, for example, has brought these data into their harbor, harbor management plan review process already, which is super cool. Uh, and then we've also shared it with researchers uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, NOAA, which is the um, in, in, in the states, and it's contributed to these yeah these nationwide and these coastwide uh, databases about eelgrass distribution. So I've outlined the Gibson's Harbor data in orange or in a red box on that slide. So in a nutshell, this is an example of research that's directly informing action and fulfilling community needs and priorities to improve ocean health. It's been super inspiring to see how many people have already made use of this data. And I look forward to sharing it with many more groups down the road. So at this point, we're going to stop talking a little bit, sit back and relax, relax as we watch a short movie created to showcase space, some of the people who are instrumental to the guide to sex and hear why they care about the Marine Reference Guide and what they're the most excited about the project going forward. Shout out to Kieran Brownie who has created this video and to all the folks who participated in the interview. All right. Absolutely beautiful. It's one of my biggest passions. The interconnectedness of everything. I think about compromise. And future. Teaching. Diverse. I think resilience is, a, is an important word. I think of mist and rain and storms. There's not just one word, but the the combined sense of well-being is what I get when I think about the sound. Traditionally, as, as Skohomish people, it was a very big part of our travel. The knowledge that is held within How Sound is so hard to put into English words. There is just such an abundance there, and maybe it hasn't always been like that with the hard and terrible things that have happened in the sound that have kind of led us to where we are but the passion and the love that resides in House Sound, not only from Skokomish people, but just from the generations of other people who have lived and worked and played there is um, so abundant. When you drive up the Sea to Sky Highway and you look out at House Sound, it's like looks like a two-dimensional flat surface. But meanwhile, underwater, there's all kinds of drama unfolding, and it's drama that matters. And so the Marine Reference Guide is a way to pull back that curtain and see what's happening underwater, not just with the marine life, but also in terms of what it is that people care about, what it is they value, and what's important when we go forward and make decisions about the sound. The Marine Reference Guide's goal is to protect the diverse economic, ecological, social, and cultural values associated with how sound at Katsum's ocean and freshwater. We work toward this goal by doing three things. First, we conduct research and create decision support tools like interactive maps that inform marine spatial planning and place-based education. 
Second, we host community engagement activities, such as knowledge sharing workshops, storytelling, and stewardship events, to strengthen people's connection to this special place. Finally, we devote a ton of energy toward relationship building, because we understand that protecting the diverse ways that people value and access the ocean requires a strong foundation of trust, collaboration, and respect. The Marine Reference Guide is a fantastic example of bringing knowledge together from multiple sources. It's individual groups, governments, uh, traditional knowledge keepers. They each have a valuable piece of information about this complex area, but it isn't until it all comes together that you really see how truly amazing and diverse El Katsum is. And I looked to the guide to help people who want to be a part of the sound to help us get a balance uh, between recreation, industry, residential, conservation. Uh, these are all very important features and I think no one really trumps the other. As someone who has a day job in construction and development but uh, a, a weekend passion and avocation of conservation, scuba diving, underwater photography, I see an interesting intersection where in the past, it would be adversarial or confrontational. Now, all the information's out there and it's unbiased, and it's a lot easier to hold a conversation. The Marine Reference Guide, I think, is a really powerful tool. I think bringing all those pieces together, especially in my role as a community planner, in terms of looking at cumulative impacts over time, it's gonna provide a lot of information uh, that we can use to inform more evidence-based decisions. What's really exciting is about what started off as a mapping project turned into much more than that. It's brought a whole lot of stakeholders to the table and partners to the table who normally maybe wouldn't sit down together. It's got potential for research, it's got potential for citizen science, it's got potential for education, it's just got potential in so many different aspects. And I think that, that credit is due to the people behind it. The young people that have been leading the guide have been so inspiring. A lot of the time, we're taught that leadership is about having your own vision of success and encouraging other people to help you along the way. Whereas with the guide and the people involved, it's become more about the community and what other people want around you as well. Well, I've been a part of the Marine Reference Guide for two and a half years, doing event planning for Indigenous youth on the House Sound to get them recreating and exploring and researching, get youth, youth voice back into the picture of the whole entire mix of what's going on in the house sound nowadays. We kind of started a conversation on what it would mean and what it looks like to have Squamish Stalmoch, to have Squamish people back out on the territory and back out taking care of the lands and teaching others about the territory and the lands. Um, but also really bringing in the Squamish representation um, into different aspects of what how sound looks like now and what we want it to look like and also what it's looked like in the past in the history of how sound. One of the big projects that we have been doing is data collection and surveying for herring. Uh, herring is one of the most important because of all the things that eat it and how much it provides to the ecosystem. One of the sayings that I heard was, if there's herring, there's hope. My mom recently just used the map in her school, also known as Culture Journeys and Learning Expeditions. She uses it in there to teach various things about our history and traditional ecological knowledge in the house sound. So the thing that excites me the most is how much it's been able to connect. Everyone being connected is what really like, brings up my heart and it makes me happy. That's like what I want to see from the Marine Reference Guide. I really think that the, the research tools are really going to help us, especially coming from a leadership role, having all of uh, our, our regions and our municipalities come together, uh, all our different governments coming together so that we can effectively plan, um, not just for today, but for future as well. Looking forward, our goal is that the guide will continue to provide service to the Sounds community. We hope that it enables decision makers to proactively protect both ocean health and community access. That it catalyzes new research and education projects to strengthen people's understanding of this beautiful place. 
and we hope that it inspires other communities throughout the Salish Sea, British Columbia, and Canada to conduct similar bottom-up approaches to protecting their ocean and communities. Rather than teaching the next generation of what to do to be sustainable, we need to make sure we're teaching this generation of all ages of what to do to make sure that we have a healthy and flourishing house on a castle. I think it's really important that we start to recognize that humans, human health and economies are not something that's distinct from biodiversity and ecosystems. We're all connected. All of this land that we are on right now, we're just borrowing it from future generations. We're borrowing it from our grandkids. We're borrowing it from our kids and their grandkids. And what do you want to tell them you did for the environment for when they're, when they're older? Do you want to be the one who said you sat there and did nothing? Or you were, do you want to be the one who said you tried to help? I always like to tell people just, just to be out on the land. You know, to be out on the land, having that connection especially with our youth um, and our manman. It's really good to see them out there, but if you're out on the land, out in the territory, you grow a connection, a strong connection with that, that land and this territory. Um, so, and then having that, that love and care for it, that they're gonna better protect it and better conserve and just be more respectful. So just asking people to, to get out and enjoy our territory and and be mindful and respectful of all the other creatures that, that also are using the space. Um, yeah. Alright, thank you everyone to you um, for, for popping your feedback in the chat. It's really nice to see it come in um, and your amazing feedback. We're really grateful um, to everybody who participated in that movie and a particular shout out to Kieran and Greg and Enrique who were really instrumental over the past few days of putting it all together. Um, but yeah, it's, it's such a community effort, this project, and I think that video really um, speaks to that, that work. So at this point in the project, um, we'd love to invite Johnny to um, take over the screen and the mic, and I'm going to make you a co-host now and share some of the um, work that you've been leading over the last few years. Go for it, Johnny. Um, Cough squall. Johnny Queen Sna Snapson Sai Quapsum. Scope Michelle. On and off and squall and check on one toy up with chop with chop made to TT seats. Uh, hello, my name is Jonathan Williams. I come from the Quapsum Reservation. I I reside in this uh, it's also known as North Yards. I am a Scohopmish person. I am also Cree and Neutronic. I am grateful for all you who came to share your time here with us today and to hear a little bit of what we had to share with you. Um, I have been working with the Marine Reference Guide for just over two years now and I wanted to start doing this work because I wanted to try to make a little bit of difference in my community and the stuff that's actually going around uh, in the waters in my community. And I've been happy to, to be able to do um, engagement work with the Squamish Nation and Squamish youth here in my community, which 
uh, really brought up my heart in, in the work that I got to do. Um, the first event that we had was uh, a shoreline cleanup that was hosted on Quam Quam. We actually had, uh, I think it was 14 of us or about 15 of us who canoed from Porto Cove to Quam Quam to do a shoreline cl a cleanup there. And we have also done um, a few workshops. Uh, one of them was about, a few of them were about a guardianship program that we were potentially wanting to start here in House Sound. And then uh, the main project that we've been doing lately uh, or that we were doing was the surveying and data collection for herring. So there hasn't been too much um, surveying and data collection that's gone in the house sound. Um, there's a lot of people who said that the herring went extinct here, which could totally be possible. Um, nobody really knows because nobody was doing the data collection. So nobody can really say for sure. But um, we think that there were still uh, herring in the outskirts of the ocean and still in a little bit of the places where humans won't really tend to see them. So we think that herring have always been here, but haven't been able to be able to populate back to the way they used to be. Um, I, I was doing this work with the MRG, um, with Fiona Beatty, Nolan Rakowski, Matt Van Oostam, Maya Antone, uh, Kelvin Johnson, and Kieran Brownie. All of us were a part of and went onto the boat to do the surveying and data for the herring. Uh, we actually got wetsuits so we could jump into the water and survey and data the herring from our eyesight and actually going into the water where the eggs were. Um, we, we took data and surveyed various things. Uh, we found out where the, where the spawning point had started, where the spawning point ended, um, how much spawn was there, uh, how much of the air there was a density and how many different and how many layers, if there was layers of eggs there were. Uh, we also took collection for, our data collection for uh, the water temperature and like the various animals and stuff that we saw around and even the weather of the day. Um, I, I, we wanted to start doing this work because we wanted there to be uh, information, educational and, or educational and proper information on herring in the house sound because before us there was another person who doing it his name was John Buchanan and he was the one guiding us and kind of supervising what how we started and we how we started doing our surveying and data collection of the house sound he gave us a general idea of uh, where to start and where to look for all the herring um, there was a few places that uh, we surveyed for the most part we just surveyed the west wall from the estuary all the way to about Quam Quam, or also known as Defense Island. Um, the four main zones that we that we searched the most was uh, the terminals just beside the estuary, uh, Fulger Creek, also on the west wall, and then uh, Wood Fiber. Oh, sorry, the three. And uh, those are the three main places that we went to go search all the time. And the most density that we saw was at Fulger Creek. And a lot of the eggs that we saw weren't actually able to um what's the right word uh weren't actually able to hatch they didn't get uh sorry i can't think of the can't think of the right word <laughs> sorry about that but um we did get the opportunity to actually see a herring spawn there was a community member uh, his name's uh, neil baker he called up uh matt and a few of the uh, members who were a part of this team and also a few of the Squamish Nation members. <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, me and Matt and a few of the other people went to go see if the herring was actually spawning. This isn't something that normally you'll get to see, especially here in Squamish. Uh, John Buchanan, the person who, who was supervising our work, said that for the, like the 10, 15 years that he was serving and data collection, doing data collection, he has never personally seen a, a, the herring spawn. And me and Matt doing this in our first year, uh, luckily get the opportunity to see the herring spawn. And Matt had his wetsuit and he actually got to go uh, out swimming with all the herring while they were spawning. And it's pretty, it's a wonderful thing because when they are spawning, uh, they turn the water into like this 
uh, like a, a like a kind of kind of like a blue tinge or it's like a different kind of tinge and it looks it looks really uh not i've never seen the water look like that before and to me it was pretty i was just in awe of the beauty of all the fish and all the water it was really hard to see the herring at first because of um like because the it was making it uh all murky but matt with his wetsuit went in down there and had a video with his snorkel and his goggles on and he was saying that there was so much herring that they were just flying into his goggles and just hitting them in the face i got the opportunity the next day to go uh matt brought me a swimsuit the next day and i got the opportunity to go in there too it's uh, it was pretty awesome. I that was the first time I've actually seen herring in the house sound. I've never had the opportunity to see herring before that in the house sound. The first time I even heard that herring was coming back or was in the house sound was when I was 16 when John Buchanan first came to our uh, to my uncle and taught a little bit about uh, herring to us on community over on the Quam Quam. and it's just one of the most uh, one of the best things I've ever seen. <laughs> This is at Boulder Creek, actually, this photo. <laughs> Thank you so much, Johnny. Yeah. Very cool. All of that. Thank you for your time. Um, all right, and we'll, put, we'll pop a link into the chat about um, the herring work that Johnny just spoke to. Um, and it's super cool. And we're hoping to maybe put some some more information out there and maybe a, a little movie about the work that, that he just spoke to you because it's so incredible um, and a really neat story. So now we'd love to welcome Maya Antone to share some of the work that she's been leading also with our project over the past um, year or so. Maya, over to you. Oh, I think I have to take you a co-host also. I was gonna say, my video isn't playing, but that's also okay. You can change. I don't mind. There you go. You should be able to share it now. Oh yeah, I can. Hast na na eoch te noia, my Anton Queens na te natin kawewik am ochu meoch. Hast since all went it quick wise te tuch na na imagined quiet Johnny to suhiam to at some ten quenmen to me up. So my name is Maya Anton. Uh, I come from the village in Brackendale where I'm currently calling you from. Um, really grateful to get to share some words tonight and, and just share some of the experiences that I've had with this project. I've been working, um, I guess for a year now, just over a year with the Marine Reference Guide. And um, I'm gonna be speaking to the interviews that Johnny and Nolan and I are, do Johnny, Nolan and I are doing right now. Um, so yeah, we get to interview um, Squamish Nation members, our community members about how sound um, we are listening to stories. We're actively, um, yeah, listening on how our community members are connecting to the sound and connecting to the water. Um, and this is a really important project because um, we get to really center an indigenous way of being. Um, these interviews are all about storytelling. So not only just our nation stories, our community stories, but just listening to the personal stories of our community members on um, their childhood growing up on House Sound, their childhood, um, you know, at the rivers that connect to House Sound and the mountains that also flow to House Sound. Um, so it's a really beautiful project to be a part of right now. Um, we get to listen on why um, the water is so important to community members. And I think, you know, acknowledging that um, the water is so important to everyone for different reasons. For us, there's a lot of cultural um, cultural reasons of why we want to be protecting how sound and that includes, you know, traditional diet and, and our stories, but um, also just listening to why the water is important to everyone for different, different ways and um, understanding how and why the health of how sound um, is so important and why the, the health of the fresh water around how sound is so important as well. Um, and also identifying um, why we need to protect it and I, identifying you know how we protect it because we have different ways of protecting the ocean and, and really bringing forward this Hopemish values and Hopemish ways of being when it comes to how sound and, and how we want it to look for our future generations. 
Um, we are listening to so many diverse people, diverse voices, um, diverse experiences. We're trying really hard to listen to elders, to listen to youth, to listen to adults, um, you know, a spectrum of genders. It's important that we really recognize that we have our own experiences with the water and, um, and who we are um, is, is what grounds us as Homish people. Um, so that's really exciting. And yeah, we're getting pretty far or pretty close to the end of it. I think, um, you know, we could talk to our people forever about what how sound means to us, what at some means to us. Um, but just getting to, to listen to the stories from our, our people. And um, there's so much to be said about just, um, just allowing our, our people to talk and allowing them to share their experiences with us. Um, so that's a bit about our, our interviews that we're doing. Um, we really want it to be a reciprocal relationship. relationship. So understanding um, you know, what they share with us, what our community members share with us, um, we're gonna be sharing back to our community. Um, so sharing um, all of the stories that we're getting um, with our Squamish Nation community, um, but then also putting that onto the map in a way that's um, you know, not so Western science focused, but um, recognizing indigenous science as an important piece of how sound and an important piece for the future too. Um, we know that Western science and indigenous science are very different in a lot of ways, but when we can bring both of those together to protect um, how sound and protect the watershed that flows into how sound, I think there's a lot that can be done. Um, and like Chris mentioned in the welcome, um, which was really beautiful. Thank you, Chris. Um, you know, we have so many stories of this place and um, you can just hear how sacred our relationship is with, you know, in that 10 minute welcoming that we had. Um, so imagine hearing, you know, hours of stories of it and hearing about these stories in this Chomish Snechim and the Squamish language. Um, and not only do we want to just share this with our community, but I think there's so much power in sharing all of this with, you know, um, non-Indigenous community as well who live and breathe in house sound as well. So bringing all of our communities together to protect the sound um, for all of our future generations and also um, equipping kind of the youth, us, me, Johnny and Nolan, uh, with the skills and resources to get to lead these projects is really exciting. So yeah, that's a bit about what we're doing right now. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna leave it there because I don't have much time, but thank you so much for joining us tonight and allowing us to, to share a piece of ourselves with you and, and sharing a piece of your connection of how sound with us too. Chin Quen Man told me up gratitude to all of you. Thank you so much, Maya. Yeah, I definitely agree. Bringing those Indigenous um, stories, Western stories together are so important, especially in the Capitol Hall Um, So thank you so much for that. And I just wanted to mention, um, along with the surveys, we also have a aquatic values um, survey along the interviews. Um, and we would love to have everyone here answer the survey. It's about the sounds, ocean, and freshwater. Um, and if you can fill it out before this Friday, June 11th, that would be amazing. The survey's purpose is to understand how community groups and individuals value the sounds, ocean, rivers, and streams, and to characterize community stewardship and connection to place. So Fiona has just popped the, uh, the survey link in the chat. So the people side of things is really important. Um, as collaboration is vital to sustainable waterways. Over the past few years of building our decision support tools, we've been asked multiple times, who is doing what, where in the sound? With our online interactive map to be completed, it really made sense to create a secondary map called the Community Network Map. This map is a myriad of groups and organizations who do ocean-related work projects in a capstone. This community network map was partnership with our team and the Ocean Bridge Direct Action, an OceanWise initiative. Uh, the community network map has over 150 organizations and it is growing. Each organization is sorted on the category in the left. And let's say perhaps someone wants to get involved with monitoring and restoration work with salmon, but they aren't sure what groups are out there or where to look, or perhaps um, a government wants to reach out to different stakeholders to to hear their thoughts and values on a project. Or perhaps researchers have a project that they want to collaborate with people in the sound. We hope this map continues to build upon regional collaboration and networking 
as well as build upon awareness about the Marine Reference Guide across the Sounds community. We're always keen to hear feedback. So below the map is a feedback form. Um, you can check out the community network map in the link in the chat, which I just put in there. All right. Um, well, we're pretty much reaching the end of our presentation tonight. It was definitely a whirlwind. I'm sorry we were speaking pretty quickly, and I hope that the sound is okay. <laughs> I'm going to come close to the mic again. Um, but this is the point where we want to share a huge thank you to the many groups and individuals who have led and supported this project for the past few years. The guide was, oopsie. <laughs> the guide was truly a community effort. Um, it brought together folks from across the entire sound, from Gibson to Squamish, West House Sound, the Sea Sky Corridor, the many, many islands, Vancouver, and the Lower Mainland. So the faces that you're seeing now include the seven staff members behind this project and four volunteers who championed all of the work that has been shared today, as well as the 12 steering committee members who poured countless hours and days into shaping the project, the elected officials from the Squamish Nation and the local governments who inspired and provided leadership for this project, um, and the many, many foundations and governments, advisors and organizations whose support enabled us to achieve our goal. It's pretty incredible seeing everybody up here on the slide and um, it's just a huge testament to what you can do when you all pull together in the same direction and um, channel your energy toward a common vision. So thank you very much. Uh, so here are 10 things that you can do to celebrate how sound packs them. You can share knowledge with our aquatic values survey before Friday. You can explore our online interactive map, and you can also register for our technical webinar on June 29. To see other ideas in the blog link um, posted in the chat. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us and loving how Santa Catsum as much as we do. So that, that closes our event tonight. Um, we will be posting the recording in the next few days and sharing it with everybody as well as a link to the video that we shared tonight so that you can watch it on your own time on your own screens and um, hopefully see it in really high quality and pace it's a little bit blurry over zoom um, thank you to everybody it's really wonderful seeing your messages come through in the chat so if you do have anything that you want to share with us please send us a note um, and you can also always get in touch with us through our website and through our email um, we're going to be wrapping up this project at the end of this year. So um, if you have anything that you'd like us to work on or bring into the map, let us know between now and then, and um, we're, we'd be super happy to do that. Um, so that's it. We ended two minutes early, <laughs> which is great. Um, we'll probably keep the chat open for a little while, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll turn our, our microphones off and our video off now. Um, and thank you again. Happy World Oceans Week. Happy World Oceans Week.